there's a ton of people, which is great to see, right? Uh, I mean, that's always what amazes me is how how this industry, thank you, how this industry is growing so quickly. It's unbelievable, right? Every year I think to myself, oh, you know, okay, now we're going and then it's bigger and bigger. And uh, it used to be like that I knew everyone and now there's so many, you know, it's, it's great to see this. I think it's exciting. And, and I think there's a reason for this, right? Because, I mean, look how many clinical trials. I mean, last, this year has not been the greatest for biotech, right? Just because of financial investment and stuff like that. But still, I think this industry has actually suffered a lot less than others. And, you know, the, 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 the feedback, the, you hear from people, everybody's moving ahead step by step. But it's really great to see how these different technologies, therapies, I, what I really like to see is that you have, you know, it used to be just the biology, now you've got the engineering in parallel, the IT issues, like the whole platform that is needed to push these therapies. So that's great to see. If you think about traditional biotech, Okay, you always, you've got a GMP, a good manufacturing process, right? And basically that means you're always doing the same thing, right? You are making sure that whatever the process is, it is completely the same time and time and again. That, that is a good methodology if you always have the same input, right? If you always have the same process and you always have the same input coming in, you'll always get the same output. The fascinating and beautiful thing about cell and gene therapy is that you're taking cells from patients. And even if it's an allergen A or it's an autologous, doesn't matter, you have a, a, a variance, a, a, a change in the input, right? So if you if you're having a changing input, because every person's a bit different, right? The cells are coming in a bit different, and you do exactly the same process, obviously you're gonna get a different output, right? And that's very different from traditional biotech. Now, regulators, I mean, some usually very clever people, they understand that. But how do you move a regulatory system? that has been built around a concept of not changing and no adaptability. And how do you move that into a system now that, you know, okay, you have to be in the range between this and this, and what happens if it isn't? It's really a little bit of a different mindset. And, you know, regulators are bound by the laws. <laughs> it's not that they get to say, hey, I do today what I feel like, right? So, the, and, and, and a lot of the regulators are really understaffed, right? I mean, people don't, I think governments don't always understand how, how, how much it's important to give resources to regulators. So you've got regulators who understand the issues, but are bound by laws <laughs> that, and, and the, you know, it's kind of a race to change guidelines, change methodologies. Another area is like, centralized and decentralized production, right? So I'm really, you know, there's been a huge progress from the regulators and trying to really build up the guidelines because if you're treating on a patient by patient, batch by batch, or even if you're doing like a pool batch, you still have this, you, you don't need these big facilities, right? And, and the, I mean, like what we do, right? We try to provide our arm pools for, for like, and we allow, we build these hubs that allow in each country to do decentralized production and supply. So they're trying to find a way for the regulatory system to allow that. But on the other hand, we have to abide by all, you know, the existing legal system. So I think it's not only a challenge for companies, I think it's a big challenge for regulators as well. They're dealing with, you know, it's not easy for them. <laughs> Do 
you know, when people started uh, doing cell and gene therapies and, and working in that, it was like, oh, everybody's got the most unique process in the world because there were so many unknowns. People didn't have the experience of working with these therapies. And, you know, if you were the first CAR T or the first pills or the first whatever. And, um, and now with there's so many of these therapies in development, you, you actually find out that, well, they're different, but a lot of it is the same. Not everything is different, right? So there's a lot of stuff that you can say, hey, you know what? This package of the CMC or this part of the process, they're actually the same. And when we harmonize, we actually, we can standardize, right? If there's harmonization, you can enable standardization. And that can save so much work. Like if every company has to do a full CMC package and there's not like, if, but if you can standardize, let's say 70% of the car people. So you don't have to go through the whole regulation. No, this you can do like this, it's optimized. You can always do the same thing. You don't have to invent the wheel and your added advantage or, or differentiation per type of therapy can be on the next 30%. You're saving everybody, the regulators, you know, test everything, the companies, the development teams, every, you can reduce risk because that part of the process is already set. So like any other maturing industry, if you have a harmonized kind of regulatory system, then you can start kind of implementing packages that are already standardized and accepted by everyone. It's always standardized. You're moving from one place to another. You don't have to test it again. Are we always using like the same quality kind of standard? Yes. So are you using for parts of the process? Like if you're always doing the same T cell expansion, why not have a standard protocol for T cell expansion? It doesn't matter if this is a T cell that has been you know, transduced with this virus and other, as long as you're doing the same standard protocol, you're using same media, same this. Uh, also for all kinds of cell selection technologies, right? If you have a validated standardized process, then you can just continue and use that. Think of this in a moment, and I, and I always like to compare that. When, when you're making cell and gene therapies, what are you doing? You're taking a cell from a patient and you're reprogramming it, okay, right? And you're actually running through an algorithm. It's almost, it, it is in a way software, it's coding, right? Maybe you're using viruses, maybe you're using CRISPR, maybe you're using electrophoration, maybe you're using mRNA, cytokines, whatever you're doing, you are running that biological cell through a kind of a computational process. Now, for anybody who deals and, and kind of the data is being the initial kind of platform that you're working on should always be the same platform, right? You don't want to invent a different type of phone for every time you have a new app. You want to standardize things, correct? That enables the whole, if you and I are all using the same platform, it just makes things so much easier, right? But if anybody wants to learn a piece of software is gonna, is gonna have to invent his own computer, it's never gonna end, right? You won't have the ability to move things quickly. It's exactly the same when you're talking about computational processes in biology, but these are computational processes. I mean, biology in its essence is computational. It's an algorithm, it's learning, it's, a, it's kind of a biological code learning on ourselves, right? Split in half, do this, go like this, express that, right? Repeat. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, they have a memory, everything. So when you, and in the early days of coding, right? Every software engineer would write his own card from A to Z. That is long gone, right? When you want to do a code today, there's a whole kind of <laughs> big packages of code. You don't have, it's like today we're doing cell coding with assembler, <laughs> okay? Languages. You know, I remember when it was zero, zero, one, zero. I mean, we don't need that. We have to go beyond that.
We have to have uh, uh, an accepted software language. So maybe for one indication, you use that type and another, another type. That's okay. I mean, programmers use that. So that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a deep understanding that cell and gene therapies are actually computational processes. And we have learned as, as a species, as human, right? So much. We have such a deep understanding of computational processes. And it's like the biological world is there and the software and computational sciences are there, but they're actually the same thing, especially for cell and gene therapies, because you're not, you're really doing a process with input and algorithm and you're getting an output. You're not building things, you're reprogramming them. It's a different attitude, right? And, um, and one of, and, and look, synthetic biology, that's not around the corner. It's here, it's already here. I mean, today, maybe we do a call. Okay, a call is a simple process, but we just add plus one, <laughs> okay? But we're already talking about synthetic promoters. We're already talking about so many clever things, adaptability per patient, if and or, and this is you. So as people in the drug industry, right, in the biotech industry, we have to accept the fact that we're in this brave new computational world and we cannot keep on falling back to existing paradigms because they just don't work for this, okay? <laughs> So many, I mean, oh, there's so many amazing things, but really, I think we we are sitting on really, we just, synthetic biology is has stepped into the room. It is here. And, and I really, sometimes I say to kind of people that are not from this, is you don't know what's coming, <laughs> okay? People think, oh, the IP, you know, the communications revolution. Look what's happening. We are learning to reprogram ourselves. We are learning to reprogram not only ourselves, but mammalian cells. We are learning how to change our cellular function by reprogramming cells. And we are just, we're like elementary school, kindergarten, okay? And there's a whole, and the moment we understand that this is a computational science and we pull in our knowledge on how to run these processes. And, and that goes for everything. It goes for AI, it goes for, uh, you know, how to uh, um, memory, everything. Once we kind of comprehend that we don't have to invent the wheel here, we just have to adopt the basics of another industry that's been developed and connect it to this industry. And then we can really push ahead. It's a convergence. Okay, it's like you have big data, analytics, uh, AI, and imagine what will happen when we'll have quantum soft computing available so you can combine it with decoding biologists. So I think there's so many great things. I love the autologous therapies because they, you know, it's like, use your own cells, that's great, right? <laughs> I mean, I know people talk about, oh, we'll make a shelf product and allergenic. That's great if you can do it, but I'm sure for many, many therapies, you won't be able to do it. The autologous is here, it's working. And what's holding it back is not because it's so difficult, it's because we're trying to use a platform that doesn't fit it, right? So as an industry, we need to converge. We need to standardize, converge, enable every innovation to be one step ahead. So instead of a biotech company spending, let's say it has a budget of $300 million, okay? It can spend $200 million in that in revalidating and assessing what everybody else has done, okay? Or it can, and then have another $100 million for its own innovation, or it can just spend the entire $300 million in pushing ahead and using already in a validated platform.